I feel like every one of the other eight speakers right now, and I'm a little bit, I have to confess that this is quite a room, and what I have been thinking about sharing with you are some ideas that I've been working on for about a year. Um, I speak in the language of image, and so I want to use images to help me tell this story. And one of the most powerful things I love about photography is that it takes you to places of incredible beauty. And several of you in this room have stood with me in this very spot, looking at the Grand Tetons at about 545 in the morning, looking at the sunrise. And sunrises, to me, represent a new day. And that's what I feel like that we're poised at right now. Really, we're at the beginning of a time when almost anything is possible. And we see that all around the room. But it's also a time where things are not always as they seem. So when we were looking this direction, this is what we saw. But I turned around, and what we saw was something completely different. You know, and it's a completely different story. And that's kind of the moment we're in, where we don't know if we should go to the bright and shiny or if we should go and explore the shadows. Maybe we should. My main point that I want to make in my six minutes is that my philosophy of thinking about the future is that we base it, our, our intuition, our inertia is to base it on a world that we know. But that world doesn't exist. We need to change to new perspectives. And so this is a perspective on Westminster from the top of the eye. And it looks fundamentally different. It looks almost quaint, you know, where in reality what's happening there, I just had the opportunity to go to the House of Lords, is really serious business of government. It looks, you know, almost like a story fairy tale from that perspective, though. We need to look out the window more, and we need to take advantage of serendipity, like this pilot's arc that I saw flying into Chicago. So the metaphor that I want to use is the metaphor of family. This picture, many of you may have seen because I use it often, this is my mother and my granddaughter, the moment that they met. It does tell a lot of story, you know, there's love there, there's a connection, and my point for the rest of these comments is that their lives overlap, but they're going to be so very different, because the way they look at the world is completely different. Now this is the the matriarchal side of my family. I'm going to go through the boys. I'm going to start with my dad. My dad was a soldier, and he loved a particular kind of technology that was new and exciting for him. And that was this. Does anyone know what this is? It's a radio. Yeah, there we go. So many of us in our generation, I learned how to build these with my dad. We built many, many, many of them. This one's an, F, an AM FM radio. It has two crystals. We subscribed to that antenna book. And for my dad, radio was about connecting us in my house with the rest of the world. And I'll never forget the night we got up at 3 AM. We lived in Tripoli, Libya at the time, to listen to, at the time, it was Cassius Clay have his first boxing match, the one that lasted 30 seconds. You know, and we gotten up at 3 a.m. and it was a big deal, my, you know, dad and the son, and we were listening to something in real time on the other side of the planet. It was electric the way that it was. And he stayed with that technology his whole life. His life was defined by radio. He was an expert in radar, and that's what he did. And that notion of the network connecting us was very much also part of my youth. This is a picture of America in the early 1960s, you know? I mean, we really did gather in the living room around television sets. At 7 o'clock, I would expect to hear the Beverly Hillbillies, you know, and let me tell you all the story about a man named Jed. I know all the songs, you know? We were all there. It was part of our experience in another way. But McLuhan began to tell us that, wait, the network's changing us. And in fact, it did. This is a picture of Walter Cronkite, and those of you in the US know who he is. But at the time, he was the most trusted newsman in America. He was the voice of the news. And at this time, he had just gotten the news that John F. Kennedy had died. 
and the entire nation, indeed the entire world, went into three days of collective mourning, gathered around our television sets, eager for any news, and, and all the cataclysmic events that came after that. That was a point in time that I think defined my generation, where we realized that the network could really change us. Now, a little bit later, this man, Doug Engelbart, came onto the scene. And this is a picture from the mother of all demos in 1968, where Doug in demonstrated video conferencing, hyperlinking, um, the mouse, yes, that was a big one, graphic user interface, all of those things, such to the point that Alan Kay said at the 40th anniversary of this, what will Silicon Valley do when we run out of Dan Gigabart's ideas? And I was electrified by this technology. This was my radio. The computer for me was a way to connect to the world, and I began to see the network as something, as Doug did, he talked about human augmentation, as something that could really help us. And we see that in the work that we've done in the last couple of decades, that the network has been built out to help us in a myriad of ways. This is my son. My son grew up with the network and computers around all of his life. He's 27. He's a very, very serious young man, very earnest. And he would tell me right away, Dad, you got it wrong. The network is us. It doesn't help us. The network actually is us. We are the reason there's a network. And the network is here to serve us. And he's right. Today, when we get news, we get it from cameras like this. The gaggle of news reporters that you're used to seeing rushing onto the scene, they weren't there in Haiti. This picture, the first one off the scene, was taken by a person who probably was just as bloodied and battered and scared to death as the person that took it. It has a visceralness that's different from traditional journalism. This website, we are all Khalid Saeed, was the launch of the Arab Spring. And within a few days, a year ago today, as we were reminded by our colleague, this happened. And fundamentally, the world changed as a result. And I have begun to realize, as watching just the last year, that the network is not only about us, it's about notions of speech, freedom of thought, freedom of religion, freedom of expression, freedom of religion. It's about connecting the world in a way that gives everyone a voice. And increasingly, that network is everywhere. This is a picture of the Earth at night. You've all seen this before. But it's also a picture of the electric grid. This is where the electricity is. So look at Central Africa or the Amazon Basin or the outback in Australia. And compare it to this map, which is now a year old. I'm waiting for the new one to come out. This is a map of the 3G networks. Okay, now look at the coast of Australia. It's all gold. Look at the lights in Australia. The network goes further than the lights. It's surprising where it is. Now the world just passed six billion active cell phone accounts in July of 2011. We're going to hit 7 billion this year. That's going to be a phone for everybody on the planet. And 96% of those cell phones have at least a basic browser. The uptake of cell phone use around the world is incredible. Because the network expansion, the infrastructure, is easy. And so we're seeing telcos putting up these towers. This one's in Qatar. Literally, you drag it out in the, it's got a trailer hitch. You drag it out in your pickup truck and raise the tower. It's got solar panels on the top and a little generator for rainy days, which they never have in Qatar, by the way, and uh, which is why the landscape's so green. And um, But the point is, you drag that out there and you drop it and, and turn it on, and you've just extended the network 60 miles. It's pretty amazing. Now. With all of that connectivity, much of the world, most of the world, 80% in fact, and soon 85% in the US, connect to the internet with their mobile device. 
as many of you in this room are today. Increasingly, the, the internet is 3G, and we don't even really think about it much anymore. But to most people, particularly the people that are going to come to our schools, it's invisible. So when my grandson, to continue the boys through my family, okay, now we're in the fourth generation, picks up the iPad, he just expects that he's going to be able to FaceTime. He knows how to do it. He's two years old. He will never, ever live in a world where the network wasn't anywhere he wanted to be. What does that mean for what we do? When I call my grandkids on a phone from a trip, Ava will say to me, Granddad, FaceTime. You know, and I'm going, don't you realize how cool FaceTime is? I mean, like, we never had video. You know, to her, it's like regular phone calls are boring. She's expecting the network to be there. And here she is as she looks today, looking at me going like, all right, so what you got, Grandpa? You know, come on, let's, let's, see, let's see where it's going to go. And that's where I want to end up, okay, is to think about that generation, those kids, those ones that are coming our way, are expecting us to deliver something. And we have to be careful what it is. Now, this is a schoolroom in one of the better schools in New Delhi. Now, what's interesting about this, besides the fact that desks were probably manufactured in the 1880s, that's an electronic whiteboard. And when I went there, it was as dusty as it was ludicrous. We have to be careful that we don't spend the money that we have on solutions that are not going to be used. We need to make sure that we're not giving people this technology when, in fact, the world they live in has changed. The thing we need to focus on is how do we keep the magic in learning? I have a colleague that likes to say that he wants to see a world of curious people. This kid is curious. He's wondering what's going on when he squeezes that bottle. This kid is curious. He's holding plasma in his hand and wondering, what is this amazing stuff, the fourth substance of the universe? We need more of this somehow. We need to make their jaws drop. We need to make them understand the world is so cool that it's worth their curiosity. And that's the message that I want to leave you with. This is the room to do it. We'll do it together. Thank you.